All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your Liberty Radio. I, of course, am your host, The Drizzle, and today we have a very special treat in store for you. Most of you probably know our guest as the owner and proprietor of the Corbett Report, which, of course, can be found at CorbettReport.com, but you might not be aware of some of his other interests and pursuits, and that is what we are here to discuss today. And uh, maybe a little bit later, we'll get into the uh, geopolitical stuff, uh, but we'll uh, we'll try and sidestep that as much as we possibly can, because I know, James, that's probably what you spend most of your time on. So uh, without further ado, it is my immense pleasure to welcome James Corbett to Liberty Radio. James, thank you for joining us today. No, thank you for having me on and giving me a chance to talk about something other than the constant stream of bad news that we're usually inundated with. Well, that's no problem at all. Um, of course, we cover all of that stuff here on Liberty Radio as well. Uh, but of course, our primary interest is in the music and how that helps to shape the culture uh, that drives our uh, <coughs> societal engine forward. So I guess it, it might be an obvious question that gets us started today. Uh, but I don't speak a whole lot of Japanese. Uh, I'm sure most of my listeners don't either. So... The first question that I had when I found out that you were a musician and were actually recording and producing music as part of a band, and once you corrected me on the band name, uh, it got my mind wondering, what does Kodomo-san mean? And did I pronounce that correctly? You did. That's good. That's fine. Kodomo-san, sure. Um, well, okay, so... <laughs> I suppose literally, uh, I, it is said sometimes in actual Japanese, day-to-day -day Japanese, when someone is talking about a group of children in a sort of, uh, with a sort of honorific title to it. So it's, it, it would be like, uh, where did I hear it? For example, I heard it at the local uh, library here when they were going to have uh, story reading time, picture book time. And they were saying, oh, you know, get get all the children, you know, make sure they're all ready for the, the story or something like that. Kodomo-san, group, a group of children, essentially. Um, the, the origin of the title is a multilingual pun that involves uh, necessary knowledge about Japanese pop. And uh, it, it's just, it's a stupid, stupid name that I wish we could, I wish we had any other name in the world at this point, but anyway, it's our name. So <laughs> you know how band names go. Oh yeah. Well, they usually come out of nowhere. Uh, they don't make a whole lot of sense to anyone yeah. outside of the band. And yeah. uh, yeah, the stories behind them are usually not as. Uh, no, it, it's a stupid dumb pun but at, at any rate here's here's the story i'll go with for today a man appeared on a flaming pie and said you will be kodomo with the sand and we are so there you go that's actually that's pretty good as far as origin stories go <laughs> i don't think i've heard the flaming pie before i i think it might have been used once or twice yeah. <laughs> so for folks that have not had a chance to hear the band uh and the music uh, that you produce, how would you describe the sound? Uh, I'm trying not to use the term dad rock, but, um, well, uh, <laughs> I mean, let's face it. Uh, we are all middle-aged. We are all, uh, family men at this point, married with children, and we all formed our musical tastes. Well, actually our oldest, the oldest member of our band was, Slightly more 80s than uh, than myself, but at any rate, most of our musical taste was formed in the 90s, and it probably shows. <laughs> and but we, I mean, I, yeah, it was interesting. We played a gig the other night, and uh, the the proprietor owner of the the club was it, it was his first time hearing us, and he's like, "Oh, so you guys are punk rock?" And I'm like, "Well, there's elements of that. There's hard rock. There's even some kind of pop rock in there. I mean, it's kind of." 
I, again, forged in the crucible of early 90s alternative music, which kind of could straddle a bunch of different genres. And my formative band growing up, the one that I loved in the 90s, was the Smashing Pumpkins. And what are the pumpkins? They're sometimes verging on metal, sometimes hard rock, sometimes psychedelia. So, I mean, they go all over the place. So, yeah, I'd like to be like that, too. Yeah, and uh, I think that you guys have uh, succeeded. Because, um, again, I'm, I don't consider myself an authority on the band. Uh, I don't think I've even heard every single track that you guys have produced yet. But what I have heard, uh, I have enjoyed immensely. And You probably right. have not heard the latest. Uh, we just, just this month, we got our new EP. That's awesome. Yes. So where can, where can folks find that? <laughs> Currently, maybe nowhere. I think we're in the process of getting this on Bandcamp. And there will be a digital version, but get the physical version. Come on. Oh, yeah. What do you do? Physical media um, but, is always better. Yeah, but we're still working out, like, how, how are we going to ship this and who, you know, who, who collects the money and then how are we going <laughs> to... I'm not expecting we'll make a lot of money on this, but still, you know, we have to have something set up. So I, details will be at kotomosan.com eventually, I, I'm thinking. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, we're we're great salesmen, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in in this line of work, you kind of end up as a salesman by default, and you just kind of yeah. learn it's, as you yeah, get through. Yeah, actually, that's kind of like the Corbett report. Like, I, all I ever wanted to do was do some research and you know put some of it out there. And hey, guys, here's what I found. And but of course, it involves. Well, now I have to become this audio production expert and a video production expert, and I have to th think about you know. Okay, so now I have to do interviews and all of this stuff, and it mushrooms out. And it's the same thing. I just I just want to write some songs, but you know, there's a lot more in involved to it than that. Oh yeah. So who who would you say is the primary creative force in the band? Is it one person or do several members share that responsibility? We definitely share responsibilities. And you would see that if you ever came to a gig because um, we uh, so there's four of us in the band. Right. And three of us are songwriters and we are all we're all writing songs all the time. So um, and so uh, our our bass player, the person who is standard, our standard bass player, um, Murray Carr, um, when he writes a, a song, obviously he'll switch over to rhythm guitar because it's easier. And either me or Sean, Sean Smith, uh, Smith, the other member of the band, will will go over to bass. And so we're doing like you know literal physical instrument changes and all of that. So it is a, a dynamic band, oh, that's <laughs> a triple awesome. threat at least. Yeah, absolutely. But that's. Um... One thing that I always enjoyed seeing in a concert setting was band members switching up the different instruments that they were playing, right? Because what that demonstrates, and maybe you know, the majority of the audience isn't even paying attention to it, but what it demonstrates is their versatility as musicians as well as their selflessness as artists because i'm sure you've encountered uh this type of person in your experience in music as well as i have and and probably any anybody else that considers themselves a musician but there are always those people uh who for whatever reason will not uh give up what they see as the spotlight you know in other right, words yeah. if you have a guy that's always played lead guitar uh, and yeah. that's that's all he ever wants to do. It can create a lot of friction uh, yeah. in in the group. For sure, I I can understand all of those kinds of politics and dynamics, but that's definitely not in Kodomo San. We, uh, in fact, <laughs> when we have decided on our our standard sort of live st uh, stage. Um, set up and who's who's where and I had to basically force Sean to go center stage <laughs> he never ever wanted to, to be out front and center but I'm like yeah you should be in center that's funny that sounds a lot like uh Maynard James Keenan of Tool because he's notorious for like being off to the side of the stage or behind yeah. The, yeah, yeah. the drum set or you know wherever yeah. so how did the four of you uh come together uh, to form this band? Like, how did, how did you all meet each other and decide that this is what you wanted to pursue? 
All right. Uh, how far back do we go? I mean, myself personally, I uh, started out, um, my brother um, got a guitar when I was in my teens. And so I picked it up a little and I thought, oh, that's, that looks like fun. I'd like to learn some. So I took some lessons for several months anyway, until it got to the part where I had to start practicing scales and all of that and like learning a little bit about theory. And I'm like, ah, I'm not going to be a musician. I'm not, I, I got other things to worry about. Nah. So I kind of put it to the side and maintained my sort of beginner level guitar for 20 years or so. And then, um, so in Japan, uh, uh, not when I originally moved here, but soon thereafter, I met Sean, Sean Smith, the uh, lead guitarist. And we were co-workers and we, we were roommates for a while. And we we both loved the pumpkins and we talked about music and what have you. And at some point, um, probably a decade ago or something, we, we talked about, you know, we should have a band. We should do, we should do that. And it was just talk. And I never thought it would be a reality. And then it started to become more common talk and like, we should, we really should do this. And at that point, uh, I, I, I'm, we were also co-workers slash friends with this other guy who had had, had his, he has his own like a uh, solo presence on uh, Moo Carzy online where he puts out he's been putting out albums for a while actually and so I talked to him like hey you know we'd like to start a band would you like to would you like to come in and we need a bass player and he has a bass so hey you know it'll work <laughs> and. Uh, and so he's like, yeah. And at that point, um, me and Sean, we'd, we'd done a couple of songs, like it's just like we'd written some stuff, but just recording ourselves on the acoustic, you know, nothing fancy. And uh, I passed a couple of those songs over to Murray and he has some actual experience and background and has used logic and all of that. So he uh, whipped up some some demos uh like in literally about 24 hours. He took our demos and whipped them up into real like actual demos on logic and everything and and as soon as i got that back and i heard what he'd done with it i'm like oh my god we could be a real band <laughs> this is amazing so then oh well we need a drummer and murray knew this guy from his work that needed uh, that was a drummer and wanted to play so we came together and that was it um it was it was miraculous it happened very quickly and I, I, you know, again, it's one of those things like the corporate report. I never expected I'd start a website. I never expected to be a podcaster. I never expected to really be in a band, but here we are. So is there, there anything about that, uh, that process, right? The, the forming of the band that if you had the opportunity to go back and relive that experience, like, is there anything that, that you would change about it. Like, you know, maybe, maybe you would have planned a little bit better mm. for this instance or, you know, done this a little bit differently. You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, what would, I, you know, not really because it was all a learning experience and things develop at the pace that they should develop. It's like, it's like back when I started the podcast and in those early years, I was putting in a ton of work and effort and really doing my best and doing work that I knew. I mean, there's something here. This is good stuff, but it, hardly anyone knows about it. It's not a big thing. I should I should have more listeners. You know, why aren't more people listening to me? Um, but looking back from all these years later, I'm like, you know, I'm glad that it built up gradually over a long period of time because then it's more or organic and if you get a lot of attention too quickly, I've seen so many people sort of just basically burn out very quickly and leave the space. No, I'm I'm here for a long time. I'm building up along. And in the same way with the band. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, for example, um, one of the things that I think made the band a reality is that, as I say, I started getting guitar lessons and very quickly ended when I was like 17 years old. Well, about five or six years ago now, um, I met a via online, uh, Vinny Caggiano, who is a guitar player, teacher, composer um, in California. And I stumbled upon his um, YouTube channel, uh, must have been five or six years ago. And he had this series where he was doing a musical analysis of Beatles songs, but like real deal musical analysis, really getting into the, the music theory side of it. And 
for whatever reason that tickled my geek music geekish uh, fancy and so i i just got totally hooked on his videos and i i plugged them in one of the truth music uh, videos that i did and we ended up connecting that way and then at some point uh, after i'd interviewed him a couple of times and we talked he's like hey you know i i do online guitar lessons would you like to start taking online guitar lessons with me. And I, I thought about it for five seconds. I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, of course. Why not? This is an opportunity. Sure. So I, I've and, and we still do a weekly lesson at this point. And so I've been doing that for for years now. And part of that process, you know, progressing beyond the beginner level, shall we say, um, has been part of that buildup like that you know i'm at the point now where i should have been when we started the band but hey <laughs> better late than never <laughs> so but that's part of the buildup as well yeah i should have been better i should have done this i should but whatever it's just the way that it organically develops and i'm happy with that yeah well it it seems like in most endeavors that uh, that we participate in or that we have an interest in participating in that's kind of how it happens, right? Is things come to you as they're needed. Um, I mean, I've found that to be true in my own life uh, as well as in the conversations that I've had with others. So that leads me to my next question, which is with all of the commitments that accompany family life as well as operating something like the Corbett Report, where do you find time for other pursuits? Well, uh, good question. Thankfully, I'm not a normal human being, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't watch TV. I don't do. I, I, there's so much that I don't do that. Um, basically, yeah, I work an awful lot. I spend a lot of time with the kids, with the family. Absolutely. And then beyond that, music. I mean, that's pretty much what fills my days. So, and this, I think, is the needed outlet for my creative energies in a totally different space where I don't have to think about what I'm thinking about every day for work, right? This is my chance to leave that work environment. So if for me, I think it's it's one of those things people sometimes ask, you know, how do you keep your head? How do you not lose it looking at all this information every day? Well, part of it is just having another outlet that I can do something else. And then sometimes those worlds collide. So um, here's something that most people probably don't know. Uh, my most recent uh, podcast documentary on how BlackRock conquered the world, mm -hmm. I knew, I knew that I wanted to score that one. Because I've got this cool keyboard here hooked up to Logic. I've got the Arturia plug-in and everything. Like, I can make a million sounds on it. And I haven't really properly explored it and or exploited that. I, I did do, um, on Who is Bill Gates, I did the uh, theme track for that. Um, uh, the Media Matrix, uh, Murray whipped up that, what became the theme track for that. Um, so I've done a little bit of that, but for this, how BlackRock conquered the world, I, I was like, I'm going to do the music, all the music. Why use any stock music, whatever I can do it. So I did. And I sent myself that old task. Now <laughs> I knew about this. I mean, I had weeks and weeks and weeks to think and prepare about this and kind of thinking about the different musical beats that I'd need and okay, okay, how am I going to do this? And then it came down to the wire of, okay, I want to release this on Monday. It's Thursday. I better get scoring. And it's a, you know, it's an hour long piece. So it's a lot of music. So basically, basically I, for a one long weekend, I basically put, locked myself in the room here, came out occasionally to eat and sleep and just just scored for however many hours a day. It was insane, but hey, <laughs> there's an actual score that I came out with, fif about 50 minutes of music or something like that, which was an incredible learning experience actually, because scoring is very different to songwriting. Um, obviously you wanna maintain, you don't wanna bore people's ear, but you do not want them to concentrate on the music. You don't want to steal their attention with it. So there's this weird thing you have to do where you have to have some sort of harmonic movement, and but you don't want it to be too interesting. You don't want it to be too boring and uh, you got to get the levels right. It's, it's crazy. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm sure I can do better, let's say, than what I did. But at any rate, hey, for a first attempt, it was, it was fun. But that, that speaks to that work-life balance. And then when those two things <laughs> merge, 
basically it was all I was doing for one very, very intense long weekend. <laughs> well, I did actually uh, consume that uh, documentary on BlackRock, I think maybe about three or four days ago. And one thing that I can tell you is I don't remember much of the music from it. And that means yes. that you Yay. succeeded. <laughs> Mission accomplished. If you didn't think about it or notice it or wasn't mm -hmm. distracting, then I will say mission accomplished. Yeah. Because that was my goal. job. Good. Yeah. Yay. So I assume that since your wheelhouse is, you know, ostensibly conspiracy theories, right? I assume that you're familiar with the 432 hertz versus 440 hertz little dialectic thing sure. that's going on. Yep. What are your thoughts uh, on All right. this subject? Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, let's get into it. Uh, <laughs> no, I, of course, I have definitely heard about this and looked into it a few times. And I'm open to there being something there, but I don't believe... I, personally, I'm not convinced that there's something there. Um, I, uh, when I have looked into it, and it's been a few years since I've done a deep dive, maybe I should do another. And I'm always open to, if people have suggestions for things that I should be looking into, sure. Um, but I remember the last time I did a deep dive, I, it, it seemed completely arbitrary to me. It did not seem that there was much there there. And one thing, here's, here's a test. Here is a test that I would use for something like that. And it's the same for, for like the, the backward masking conspiracies in music, like, oh, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. Led Zeppelin backwards and they say worship the devil or, so, or whatever it is. No, 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 no. Here's, here's the way to actually find out if something like that exists. You take that, that backward mask sample and you play it for someone and you say, what do you hear? And they spont they say, oh, well, maybe I heard a word that sounded like ham sandwich or whatever, right? And then you go, oh, okay, well, no, I, I heard worship the devil, you know? Uh, um, you see this very clearly. Um, I, I've seen this before where someone will play some sort of like backward mask sample and no one understands what it's saying and then they play it with the with the words you're supposed to be hearing and suddenly oh yeah it does kind of sound like that it's that that kind of thing where if you don't if it's a blind test no one passes the test same thing 432 versus 440 play me play me two samples that are recorded in 432 and 440 and make me decide which one is better which one i think is 432 you know and nine times out of ten people aren't it's it's a coin flip. I don't think people can truly tell. Now, maybe I'm totally out to lunch and maybe it's really harmonically tuned to our natural resonant frequency on the earth or whatever you want to say. I just haven't been convinced of that yet. Um, but as I say, I'm always open and exploring. And if, if people have a convincing argument on that, I'm certainly open to it. Well, I will say that the the one part of the argument that falls apart for me uh, regarding 432 hertz and being a natural frequency of the earth is that we still don't have conclusive evidence that humans are natural to the earth. So while the hypothesis sounds, you know, really good, you know, we still got a bunch of, of missing pieces of evidence sure. here. So I can out conspiracy your conspiracy. Right. <laughs> We're not even from the earth, man. We're from Mars, which is actually 440. So there you go. Right. And it's also a 24 and a half hour day, which apparently oh, yeah. more closely aligns with the human circadian rhythm. So, mm. yeah. Hmm. Well, there you go. Of questions. Lots, Lots of, of questions. questions. So I will say when I was putting together the thumbnail for this, uh, I did a quick Google search for images of James Corbett so that I could use one in the thumbnail, right? I had a very <coughs> difficult time finding photos of you with that Google search. And that caused me to pose this next question to you. Um, and it wasn't just for you. I tried to do the same thing with the band uh, mm. and again, came up with even fewer results uh, than what I did on the Google search for James Corbett. So is that your doing or somebody else's? 
Oh, it, yeah, I, I wouldn't even know how to do that if I could. Um, maybe I would if I could, but at any rate, no, nothing to do with me. Uh, that's all, that's all Google. That's all the magic of Google, assuming you're using Google image search. Um, mm -hmm. I can say, I remember, actually, let me try it while we're speaking. Uh, let's see, if I go to Google and if I type in James Corbett, there was a point at which, oh, okay, well, there you go. Seems fairly neutral at this point, but there was a point um, in the not too distant past where when I typed in James Corbett into Google, it would uh, show like the, uh, the info box on the side would be like, uh, I, th I think from IMDB. And hmm. the picture that they used was a picture that uh, that Brock did up, my video editor did up for one of the uh, the videos I did. Um, I can't remember the name of the video, but I went with something like, you know, uh, James Corbett is the worst person in the world or something like that, because there had been a, a, a hit piece on me recently um, at, at the point that I recorded that, where they were, uh, I think denigrating the Century of Enslavement documentary at that point or something like that. Anyway, so I did this video and, and Brock for the thumbnail did this, parody image it's like me but with like devil horns <laughs> like oh the worst person on the world and somehow when you type james corbett into google that was the image that would show up in the sidebar for like james corbett it was like me with the devil horns and everything like it was just it was ridiculous um i'm not getting that at the moment but maybe it's a geographical thing so who knows but um but yeah no i've definitely I, it's definitely part of the algorithmic uh the ranking of me that has taken place in the past several years, because let's be realistic. There certainly are other James Corbett's in the world. And there are some that are doing some, you know, there's writers and artists and what have you. So sure. Absolutely. But let's be real. I mean, of the James Corbett's in the world, surely I have a pretty prominent online presence at this point, right? I had several hundred thousand YouTube subscribers. I have had however many tens of millions of views and, what have you, people have written about me, et cetera, et cetera. You'd think I'd, I'd show up pretty prominently in the top searches for a James Corbett, right? Mm. But these days, not so much. And um, I, 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 it, it's certainly related to the, the search de-ranking of the Corbett Report generally that went on a few years ago. And one of the most obvious examples of that that I often cite was uh, back in 2000. I want to say 19 when um, maybe 18 when Chris Matthews of MSNBC did this little Twitter tirade about, oh, my God, imagine you're a high school student at, tasked with finding out about Federal Reserve and you type Federal Reserve into YouTube and you get this. And he shows a screenshot of my Century of Enslavement documentary. And, you know, he goes on this big tirade about how horrible this is. And wouldn't you know it, the very next day, if you type Federal Reserve into the YouTube search bar, suddenly century of enslavement doesn't show up at all hmm. okay interesting so going from literally the first thing that would show up to being not even on the top first page and it got to the point where even if you were typing in federal reserve in or century of enslavement even in quotation marks with james corbett or the corbett report next to it as a search term you could not find it on my channel you could sometimes find some of the reposts that people had done on their own channels but you could not find the link to my channel so there i mean there was absolutely 100% a, a sort of censorship, a search algorithm anyway, change that took place several years ago to de-rank me in various ways. And I'm sure that has transferred over to the image search and everything else. Oh, I wouldn't doubt it at all. Um, and it makes me curious. Do you remember what network Chris Matthews was on at the time that he, he ran that piece? I am pretty sure it was MSNBC. That's what I was thinking as well, which, you know, when you kind of do the work to understand that that's one of the news ne networks that's more closely linked to the intelligence services getting from point A to point B is then not so difficult. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But which establishment media outfit is not in some way close to the intelligence agencies at this point? Yeah, well, I'm just I'm I'm going from the fact that like at any given time, half of their staff is like former NSA, former CIA, former, former FBI. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, cause we all know that the, you don't you don't leave the company. Uh, the company lets you know when it's done with you. Um, all right, let's perhaps let's, by setting you up for the assassination of the president or something like that. Huh? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, we can speculate on all different sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you mentioned earlier that uh, Smashing Pumpkins is one of your fam- favorite bands, one of my favorites uh, growing up, especially in the 90s as well. I imagine we're probably not very far apart in age. Uh, what other musicians do you regularly draw inspiration from? Well, I've already mentioned the specter of them several times, and I'm wearing my War is Over shirt, so I might as well, of course, say the Beatles. Uh, you will see my uh, edition of Tune In on my bookshelf over here. It's the thousand-page first volume of the projected three-volume series that Mark Lewison is writing, the definitive biography of the Beatles that tells you what particular sandwich they had for lunch on June 9th in 1959, etc. And, and I what read type every of blotter page acid they were on. <laughs> well, we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, this, I mean, literally, I, I'm not joking. This is a thousand pages on, uh, so this covers basically up to the doorstep of 1963. We, we haven't actually entered into 1963 yet. So, no. <laughs> and this is just volume one, volume two and three are supposedly on the way. They've been on the way for over a decade now. So we'll, we'll see. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think the Beatles were probably the most formative and, you know, I've talked about that before. Uh, I have a, I do a podcast now with Vinnie Caggiano. We do a occasional podcast doing musical analysis of Beatles songs, et cetera. Um, I'm just the guy on the side being the dumb every man asking the dumb every man questions. And he's the expert who can actually answer them. Um, but so I, yeah, definitely have drawn inspiration from them over the years. Um, and hey, Beatles conspiracies are fun too. And oh, yeah. I, I did a podcast with Vinny about that specifically. Everything I know about conspiracies I learned from the Beatles, I think was the title that I went with on that one. So people can look that up. Um, uh, so uh, Beatles and Pumpkins definitely loom large. Um, these days, in terms of new music that excites and interests me, um, I am all about Polyphia. I don't know if you're listening to Polyphia, but my God, no. they are. How do you so, spell that? Polyphia, P O L Y P H I A. Um, they they started out, and I think their roots are more are um, dark metal ish. But they, I don't know what they are now. Um, they are their own genre of music, and they have developed this style of playing that is completely. Uh, it, people will say that what uh, Tim Henson, the, the main guitarist is doing is is truly a different way of playing guitar and i think they're right i mean how can you play guitar any differently you know how can it but honestly go listen to the stuff that he's coming up with it is crazy it is virtuosic but amazing i i don't like those kind of virtuosic players like satriani and everything great Mm -hmm. wonderful they're amazing i could never do that in a million years of practice but it doesn't excite me but polyphia for whatever reason their music excites me um but I, I don't know. I, I don't say I can claim inspiration from that music because I could never do anything like that. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how that, I don't know how that inspires. But at any rate, just the fact that it exists is uh, exciting to me. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, inspiration can come in in all different uh, forms, right? So mm-hmm. it's it's not even necessarily that you're trying to emulate what you hear yeah. somebody Good else point. doing. Yeah. Good point. Because in fact, actually, I mean, if there was a genre of music that I think is actually my favorite, it wouldn't even be in the rock pop world. It would be jazz. I am more of a, a jazz fan at heart. Um, I remember vividly um, working uh, in. So when I was going to university, I would work at my dad's business in the summer and he was working with this guy that lent me this CD. And he's like, yeah, you should listen to this. And it was my first time listening to a jazz album. And I remember listening to it go- and going, oh, this is music for grownups. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> like, I've been listening to kids music my whole life, basically. Um, and from that point on, you know, I definitely got into jazz and huge fan. But obviously, I don't do jazz. That's not the music that I'm involved in creating. But, you know, I mean, just generally, it is inspirational in some sense. And some of that is in there somehow. You know, it'll come out in weird ways. Oh, absolutely. 
So we do have a question from the live stream audience. This comes from W.T. Stead. Uh, he would like to know what your favorite 60s band besides the Beatles is. I, yeah, uh, hmm. You know, hmm. Well, I'm not going to say the Stones because I'm not a Stones fan. Um, no, you're not uh, a fan of the London School of Economics graduate? You know, weirdly, it's not even that. I actually dislike their music as well, but that too. <laughs> um, it, okay, I guess I got to go with the animals hmm. because memory serves. They were from Newcastle. My parents are from Newcastle. My mom has this story about her rebellious teenage years where um, I think she actually snuck out of the house uh, one night to go see the animals playing at the local club. And, <laughs> and Anyway, hey, House of the Rising Sun, great oh, yeah. song. I mean, it's but, not their song, but they did it well. That, that whole album uh, is, hmm. is a fantastic album. But the answer we were actually looking for was Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. So that's a joke. <laughs> I have to uh, look that one up. As a very early 60s band. I think that was actually an answer to a trivia question on Media Monarchy last week, if I'm uh, not mistaken. <laughs> nice. Now, I did watch the unboxing video for the new Kodama uh, San yeah. uh, uh, EP, <laughs> I guess we should call it, because uh, it's only, yep. it's what, four tracks long? Five. Five, five tracks. Yeah. And uh, I did broadcast that on uh, one of the nights of Liberty Radio last week, or maybe the week before. I, I don't remember. Memory's getting kind of fuzzy as I get older. Uh, but your bandmates in the video were using some very interesting accents. <laughs> what, what was going on with that? So, so okay so when we started recording it i actually started recording it originally and i was going to do my johnny youtuber kind of thing like hey man oh, you know. uh, um but then uh, my, uh, my slave device was running out of battery so sean took over I'll, I'll record it and so he started picking up on this generic youtuber voice to hype up the uh <laughs> the grand unboxing um as you can see i I really didn't enjoy that, and I didn't want any part of it. But at any rate, there it is, recorded for posterity. Well, it was quite entertaining. So you know, <laughs> Good. From, from that standpoint, I, I think it actually uh, accomplished uh, what was uh, what was set out to be achieved. So while it while it may have been uncomfortable, I'm sure it provided <laughs> many many laughs, uh, and and uh, you know you can just. Uh, be consoled by that, I guess, <laughs> if nothing Good. else. Mission accomplished. There you go. So what is, you've obviously done uh, maybe more interviews than anybody else at independent media at this point with, uh, with the crazy schedule that you keep. What would you say is the strangest question that you have been asked in an interview? You know, I don't know. I don't think of it as strange. Just different people have different interests and things that they're they're looking for. I I do find it weird when people are asking me about like the um the meaning of life and the universe and you know, religion and stuff. I, it's like eh, it's beyond my pay grade, but I'm no guru. Um but I don't I don't mean it's not weird that they ask that. Have I ever had a strange question? Um I'm racking my brain. I'm not thinking of anything. Well, that, that um, is the first time. I don't know. Has anybody stumped James Corbett before? I, I might be able to claim a trophy here. Maybe, okay. maybe. But y you may not be the first person that's asked that question. I'm not even sure. <laughs> oh. I, right. I've done more of these than I can even remember. So who knows? Well, I'll go digging through the archive then. And uh, if I find that nobody else has asked it, I am coming for the trophy. I just want you to know. All right. That. Okay. I will, I will prepare the trophy for you. <laughs> so I want to do a little bit of turnabout on you. Because uh, again, when I reached out to you and requested the interview, uh, I referenced my friend Hervoye 
over at the mm. Geopolitics right. and Empire uh, podcast, who you spoke with um, a few weeks back, I believe it yep. was. And in that particular interview, you asked Hervoye a question uh, that I don't think I've heard anyone else ask in the way that you phrased it. So I was like, all right, let's, let's go ahead and turn this back at James and see what his answer is. So on the white pill, black pill spectrum, what shade of gray are you right now? <laughs> That's a good question. Thank you for asking it that way. Um, yeah, I, I, I am, um, you know, it really depends on the day of the week. Today I'm feeling light gray, but there are days when I feel dark gray and it really does. It really is on that knife edge um, because it depends on what part I'm focusing on. There are so many incredibly positive things that are happening right now and people waking up and people getting motivated and doing things and accomplishing things. And I talk about it at week in and week out on Solutions Watch and there's always incredible new things. As we are speaking, I've just finished recording. Brock is just getting underway in editing a Solutions Watch on the newspaper Revolution that's taking place around the world right now with all these independent newspapers, the light paper in, in England and Australia and Ireland and Druthers in Canada and all of these little independent, little independent papers that are literally distributing millions of copies and completely doing an end run around the digital censorship gulag. And there's just all these stories that are awesome and wonderful and do fill me with hope as opposed to hopium. Um, but then, then I also take a look back at what's happened over the past several years, how far we have fallen down. Uh, this is this is the thing that I often talk about with the whole scandemic. The thing that I was most surprised about was not that they would try to pull something like this. It's that so many people went along with it. So many people, even people in erstwhile independent media who should have had their heads screwed on straight, went along with it at least for a little while. And that was, you know, that was definitely disappointing and speaks to the fact that we have a long way to go. Having said that, I mean, again, this was a wake up opportunity. And I know from my own experience getting messages on a daily basis, I know there are many, 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 many people who were shaken out of their slumbers over the past few years, specifically by the craziness. So maybe that moves the gray a little bit lighter. You know, as I say, it's a day by day thing. And unfortunately, here's the thing. I know that if these technocratic tyrant planners are truly, truly know what they're doing, and if they truly want to basically get us along the road towards some sort of transhumanist nightmare, I think they can probably accomplish that. Um, there is a series of steps and kind of sudden dramatic false flags and then just steady attrition and that kind of tiptoe towards the the technocratic future I, I i think they probably could achieve that to some extent i think probably the internal contradictions in a system like that the fundamental anti-human nature of it it will fall apart but that i mean that's not hopeful because when it falls apart oh yeah civilization collapses and who knows what what that'll look like. So that's not a happy thing to think about. So I think they could do it, but I am also somewhat hardened by the fact that I think that they are not, these are, we're not talking about brilliant strategic planners who have everything under control. We're talking about uh, savant level idiots, I think might be one way of describing some of these technocratic planners. Yeah, they're uh, on, in a sense on the spectrum as people say these days. Yeah, very good at calculating numbers and figures and things like this, but the human element of it, I think uh, evades them. And we can speculate as to whether that, you know, maybe they're not human, I don't know, are they reptoids? <laughs> Who knows, right? Whatever the case may be, uh, or maybe they're just psychopaths, which have always been metaphor metaphorically referred to as reptile-like. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, at any rate, whatever the explanation for it, I think the human element often escapes their understanding and their planning. And there does seem to be a rushing towards an end goal, which seems to be, it doesn't seem to work in their favor. If they're rushing and pushing too hard, people will wake up in larger numbers. And I think that's what the last few years has represented. It's, it's like they are, really are on some sort of timetable for 2030 for some reason. 
And again, we can speculate about what that reason may be, but I think that works in our favor. If they push too hard and go mm -hmm. too fast, it will fall apart. So again, I can see the dark, but I can see the light. And it's a question of which, which side of the bed I woke up on this morning. This morning, I'm saying light gray. Well, that's good. It sounds like you woke up on the light side of the bed this morning then. Yeah. That's awesome. And I guess maybe we should touch on this really quickly uh, since we're, we're closing in on the end of the hour here. Uh, of course, last week in New York City, you know, they were all gathered at the UN, patting themselves on the back and then saying, oh, we still have so much more work to do, but we're halfway there and we haven't even hit 2024 yet. Is this wishful thinking on their part that they're halfway there or are they trying to okie doke the public? into believing that they're actually further along in their plans yeah. than they actually yeah. are. Right. Yeah, well, look at it. I mean, okay, so they officially launched the um, SDGs and the 2030 agenda in 2015. So we're actually eight years in and seven years left to go. So actually, we're over the halfway mark time-wise. But are we over the halfway mark in terms of their agenda and their goals? That's certainly debatable, but I would say probably not. Um, there's a long way to go. And as they said in their little document, oh, you know, the SDGs are in peril and we haven't made much progress in certain areas. And in some areas, we're even behind where we were in 2015, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, that might be the kind of thing that they say, you know, like when they say, oh, my God, we're losing in Ukraine. So we need billions more dollars. You know, it may be like that. Oh, we're we're losing the SDGs. So we need even more of your commitments, blah, blah, blah. So it could be that kind of psyop. But I think there is a sense in which, you know, I mean, for them to really grasp the, the whole 2030 plan and everything that they, they want to bring about by that time, there's still a long way to go. Now, having said that, who would have thought in 2000, you know, 2019 that, oh, yeah, in a couple of years, we'll, we'll be used to the idea of lockdowns and mandatory jabs and all of this. Right. You know, that wasn't even on people's radar. So a lot can happen in a few years. Um, when there are dramatic, spectacular false flags. Um, but yeah, at this point, I wouldn't say they're halfway to achieving that technocratic dream. Um, so does that, you know, does that put them in a desperation mode where they're going to try crazier and crazier stuff? Again, I'm not looking forward to that. I think that'll mean th ultimately their agenda will fail, but mm -hmm. it can fail in a way that's spectacularly horrible for billions of people, unfortunately. Well, I, I think we've already seen some of that in the last three and a half years. Uh, the, the spectacular failures that have been uh, horrible for most people uh, on this planet. Um, you know, I always try to look at it in terms of what are they missing, right? What are the unintended consequences that they haven't foreseen and how will we recognize those things when they actually occur to, to understand that this is an unintended consequence of the agenda that they've been pushing. And mm -hmm. I think as time goes by, you know, we're starting to see uh, similar to what you were alluding to earlier is that more and more people seem to be, even if they're not now becoming more aware of what the game is, they're becoming more vocal about their awareness of what's taking place. And, you know, again, going back to uh, the theory of mass formation that was put forth by Matthias Desmet, uh, he, you know, basically laid out that the way that you fight this kind of tyranny is by speaking up and by doing it constantly and loudly, you know, no matter who is telling you to be quiet, to pipe down, to play along, you just keep speaking out against it and being that example for the people who don't have that as part of their character makeup, you know, in the hopes that eventually they'll come around to your side because they'll get tired of, you know, doing all the evil stuff essentially. Um, so that's, you know, for me, that's kind of what keeps me going is, is knowing that people like you, people like me, 
you know, and, and we could go through a long list of people uh, that, are, that are doing similar things. The fact that we're all doing it at the same time, uh, I think, is one of the things that bodes well for humanity going forward into the future. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. Um, and I think that that really, that, that's what my message has always boiled down to at the end of the day. The only revolution that really matters is the revolution of the mind. And until we get our consciousness straight and we understand what it is we're doing, but more importantly, why we're doing it, I think at that point, then the they, them, those, and their manipulations don't even matter. Because as I always say, the power ultimately is ours. All the power that they have in their system and their, with their money and their economy and their corporations and their government is power that we have ceded to them and that we continue to give to them with our time, our attention, our money, our effort. And at the point at which we realize that and start to take that power back into our own hands, I think it's game over for them. So that is why ultimately the revolution of the mind is the only revolution that matters. And it's the hardest one to get people to see because until it happens, people will just poo poo it. Ah, oh, yeah, that's pie in the sky. Be, be practical, James. Well, continue being practical and see where that gets you. I think we need to have those dreams, those visions of what humanity can be and should be that are completely and totally detached from the reality they're trying to put up around us and that we are playing into. And in some cases, literally buying with our own dollars or yen. Yeah, I could not have said that uh, any better myself. And I think that's, uh, that's probably the best place uh, to end this interview because uh, trying to top that answer is, is going to be an exercise in futility as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I have the links for Bandcamp, YouTube, Odyssey, and BitChute uh, already in the show notes. I'm going to be adding the website for Kodama San. Uh, where else can people connect with the music, the band, or you know whatever else you want to uh, throw at folks right now? Uh, I believe we have an Insta account. I believe we are on Facebook. These are not my doing, by the way, guys. <laughs> this, is, this is my bandmates. <laughs> I ain't on social media, but I think we have some presence. Anyway, I think that's all linked up at Kodomosan.com. So people who are interested can find that. Um, I, you know, I, I, was, I, I actually was only looking through our Facebook uh, page for the first time a couple of weeks ago, I'm like, I don't know. I haven't, there's all these pictures of us and stuff. I'm like, I didn't even know those existed. <laughs> so cool. I, I, I'm not even sure which of my bandmates is keeping that up to date. I think it's Sean, but anyway, <laughs> you guys worry about that. And uh, I'll just worry about playing the gigs. There you go. There you go. Well, James, it has been a pleasure to, uh, to finally meet you, number one, speak face to face and uh, to, to have this conversation with you today. Thank you so much for affording us some of your time out of your very busy, busy schedule. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on to talk about something other than just geopolitics. And uh, please do feel free to play any Kodomo San you want at any time. Oh, I plan to. Uh, I plan to p play quite a bit of it, as a matter of fact. So uh, don't be surprised uh, if new fans start trickling in over time. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Well, thank you so much.